Hey everybody, welcome to Echo Church Online. Man, I'm thrilled that you chose to be a part of our service with us and our experience online. Uh, I know it's not easy to show up anywhere and it means a lot that you chose to be here and a part of what we're doing here with Church Online. So thanks for being a part of this. Thanks for being here. Uh, we hope that you get to engage with every part of our service from the music and when we sing songs together and worship God to even the invitations from our host. You'll get to see me on stage in just a few moments. And we got a great message today from Pastor Stephen as we're continuing our series, Explore God, talking about is Christianity too narrow? So please do lean in, engage with us. I'll be on after service as well. We'll be able to have a chat with our team if you want to be a part of what's happening uh, with our lobby group. And we'd love to see you there. But for now, let's worship together. Echo Church, hey, we're so glad you're here. Listen, we're going to learn a new song together today. And it's going to wake us up a little bit. The Bible says that the joy of the Lord is our strength. Does anybody believe that today, that the joy of the Lord is your strength? So come on, let's put our hands together as we sing, as we learn this together today. Come on. Joy 
God, you joy of the Lord. And because of what you've done, Lord, there is a sound I love to hear. It's the sound of the Savior's robe as he walks into the room where people pray, where we hear praise as he hears faith. Yeah, he's here with us today. Come on. Oh, he hears faith. We sing, there is. There is a sound I love to hear. It's the sound of the Savior's robe as he walks into the room where people pray, where we hear worship, he hears faith. Then we join our faith. Worthy are you, Jesus. There's no one like you. There we sing, come on. Sing his praise aloud. Yeah. Oh, I'll wait my soul and sing. Sing his praise aloud. We sing his praise aloud.
Yeah.
you're the very God who gave us breath. This is who you are. You're the very God who fills us with breath multiple times every minute, thousands of times in a day. You fill us with with new breath. God, you keep us going. You, You are so faithful. Your word says that you are kind. Your word says that you're slow to anger, that you're filled with unfailing love. Today, this is why we respond. Today, this is why we say you can have it all because of who you are and because of what you've done, God. Great are you, Lord. We're so grateful today. We love you, Jesus. We love you. Thank you for loving us. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Come on, can we thank him today for being faithful, for being kind, for being slow to anger, abounding in love, compassionate, merciful, gracious. Man, I'm grateful this is who he is today. We're so glad you're here. Welcome to Echo Church. You made a great decision coming out today. You can go ahead and have a seat. Say hello to your neighbor as you do. Welcome to Echo Church. Welcome to all those of you who are joining us online, my people. So thrilled that you're joining us. My name is Tim. I'm the Church Online Pastor here. This is my friend. And my name is Laverne Niles, and I'm an... Oh, oh, three claps. Thank you so much. (laughs) And I'm an apprentice with our Echo School of Leadership. (laughs) Yeah, <laughs> and we are so excited that you are with us today. So if you would, I would like to invite you to access our digital program. So go ahead, pull out your telephone. I'm looking to make sure people are moving. Absolutely. And what you're going to do is you're going to go to echo.church forward slash connect, or you're going to scan the QR code that's right in front of you on the chair, on the chair back, or you can scan the QR code that's right there on the screen. Yeah, and one thing we want to acknowledge as you're pulling this up and you check out the information is every week at Echo, we have people who join us for the very first time, whether you're here in the room or you're joining us online and participating in that ministry that's happening there as well. And we know it's not easy showing up any place for the first time, and church is no different. And so we're so thankful that you're here. We're proud for you for being here. We'd love to get a chance to get to meet you, to put a gift in your hands. So please swing by at the end of our service at the hub. You'll see the big red wall on the table there. We'd love to get a chance to introduce ourselves to you and give you a gift. This is our way of saying thanks for being part of this with us. So make sure you swing by by the end of our service. Now there's something else we're highlighting that's pretty exciting coming up soon, which is we're talking about our dream team. And Laverne, you're, you've got the jersey on, so I think you should talk about it. Absolutely. So we're very excited to invite you to become a part of our dream team. This is a team of awesome volunteers who make things happen, not just here in church on Sundays, but within our community and all around the world. These are people who are pursuing purpose. And what we like to do here at Echo is we like to celebrate service. So we are going to have a huge Dream Team Party on November 1st. That is a Wednesday. Yeah, that is a Wednesday night. So if you want to become a part of the Dream Team, you can access it right through that digital program that you just pulled up. You can sign up there. All right, make sure you be a part of that. There's some amazing things happening. You can check out. Also, there's a table in the lobby to ask questions and just start the exploration of being a part of that with us. Now, today, we're thrilled to be able to continue the series we've been in called Explore God. And during Explore God, we've been asking the big questions of life, faith, and meaning. And we believe there's, there's nothing that is more th- worthwhile in our lifetimes than to take a few moments and a few weeks together to be able to ask these big questions together. Yeah. Because the responses to those questions are of eternal significance. And today, we get to hear a message from our own campus pastor here, uh, Pastor Stephen Zire, asking the question, of all the faiths and in this whole world, is Christianity too narrow? So I want to invite you, pull up your message notes. Again, they're in your digital program. Go to echo.church slash connect, click message notes there, follow along, lean in. We believe there's a special word for you today. So in a few moments, Pastor Stephen will come up right after this short video.
One of my favorite things to do as a kid was convince people of things that were not real and then call them gullible. Uh, have you ever had somebody do this to you, made you believe something that you for sure thought was real only for them to go, ha I got you. Uh, I got really good at this and uh, I'm hoping that today you'll think our message is actually real and that's not what I'm doing to you. Uh, but I loved growing up to see others that enjoyed this as much as I did and then they created a website to fool as many people as they could. Uh, one of those websites is The Onion. Okay, and The Onion loves to produce a bunch of articles uh, that are fake. They're a little bit of a take on the current news cycle or things like that, but it's a, a different twist, a satire to make us all laugh and enjoy. And in 2012, The Onion caught the world by storm when they announced that Kim Jong-un was the sexiest man alive. <laughs> They said, with his devastating, devastatingly handsome round face, his boyish charm, and his strong, sturdy frame, this Pyong Bren heartthrob is every woman's dream come true. And it became widespread that China's largest newspaper picked it up as fact. And they put it out there for everyone to see <laughs> that the onion fooled them, and they believed that Kim Jong-un was voted the world's sexiest man alive. Uh, maybe he's your style, uh, not mine. Um, but there are often times where things like that happen, but there are often times where things come across our plate that are of much more significance. On January 13th, 2018, every person that was on the Hawaiian Islands received a text message that said this. A ballistic missile threat inbound to Hawaii. Seek, immediately, or seek immediate shelter. This is not a drill. For the next 38 minutes and 13 seconds, many people believed their life was coming to an end. Some tragically took their lives in preparation of what was coming. After Jim Carrey was on the island with his daughter, he got a phone call from his assistant and said, we have 10 minutes left. Boss, it was really great working for you. Thank you. And he didn't know what was happening. He hadn't checked his phone. And so when he found out the news, he went outside and he sat down and he overlooked the ocean and he tried to just be grateful for the moments that came his way. They eventually found out that there was a mistake and somebody had sent it out, an accident. But I wonder if you've ever had moments like this, where you received information and you believed it at face value. Maybe it was information about a family member, or maybe it was something that came across related to your job, or maybe it was something about a situation in your life that was very sensitive, only to find out eventually that the information you received was not actually verified by the author for its validity. You might be wondering, Stephen, why are you telling us this? And sometimes we hear things and believe that they are true, blindly acting in faith and believing the source. However, when it comes to God, so many people blindly listen to other people's perspectives on who God is rather than exploring what he, as the author, actually says about himself. I know for me personally, uh, I have heard many people describe God or say things about who he is only to later find out that their perspective and their viewpoint was completely wrong. And it wasn't until I investigated it myself that things became more clear. And to be honest, there are many Christians themselves, people who claim to be followers of Jesus, who don't read the Bible, and they take a pastor's word for it or a friend's word as the truth. And I've studied hard for this message, but I want you to also know you have all right to verify anything that is ever said by one of us to ensure its validity. So, 
in a collective attempt as a group of people, as the church, we're going to look and see what God actually says about himself. And so I want us to look at a passage in the early days of the Bible. It's in the Old Testament. There's a moment where Moses, the leader of the Israelite people, is on a mountain and he said, God, I want to see you. I, I want to know you. If I'm going to be doing all this work for you, I want to know who you are. I want to see your glory. And so God says, I will pass by you and I'll let you see a portion of me. But then God himself proclaimed these words in Exodus chapter 34, verse 6 and 7. It says, the Lord passed in front of Moses calling out Yahweh, the Lord, the God of compassion and mercy. I am slow to anger and filled with unfailing love and faithfulness. I lavish love, unfailing love, to a thousand generations. I forgive iniquity, rebellion, and sin, but I do not excuse the guilty. I lay the sins of the parents upon their children and grandchildren. The entire family is affected, even children in the third and fourth generations. I wonder, as you hear these words, are, are, are these words consistent with your perspective on who God is? As you hear these words, do you like all of the description? Or do you prefer only a part of it? See, for so many of us, we love the God that's all, oh, he's so compassionate, he just loves me. He's going to forgive me for all the stupid things I do, right? But then we do not like the part of he's going to punish my children and my grandchildren and my great-grandchildren for all the dumb things that I did. That's not fair, right? And this is often where people begin to start putting Christianity into a box, and start saying, well, you've got, you just got to be perfect to get in. Like, it's all about these regulations and these rules. And uh, of course, because of this, we have too narrow of a worldview. We need to understand things from a bigger perspective, see things as they are. And that is why we are here today exploring the question, is Christianity too narrow? Are we looking at things too siloed? Do we not have the right perspective on what actually takes place? Is it really only about rules and regulations? And I'm going to be honest with you, I don't have enough time up here to talk about every aspect of whether or not you believe Christianity is too narrow, but I hope that you will continue this conversation in your table groups. But I do want to just say that I understand there's probably four questions that come up in this conversation a lot. And those four questions are, how can we as Christians claim that we are the only way that is right? Another one is, why can't there be many ways to God? A third is, how can so many people and so many nations be wrong? And then how can God be good if he's so exclusive? Now, all of these questions are very important. But rather than dive in to dissect each of these one at a time, I wanted us to look at things from a slightly different angle. Maybe an angle that allows us to see things from God's point of view. An angle that allows us to see the love that God has lavished on his people for so long, despite our decision to reject him. And so in order to do that, we have to go back to the very beginning where God created all things. He created humans in his image, and he lavished great things upon them. He gave them dominion and said, would you join me in this beautiful thing that we've made? So in Genesis chapter one, we get to see this in verse 27. It says, so God created human beings in his own image. In, in the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. 
It says, then he blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply. That's the fun part, right? You guys know what? Three people understand. Just think about it for a second, okay? Be fruitful and multiply. I am very grateful for those five words or those four words there, okay? Fill the earth and govern it. Reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, and all the animals that scurry along the ground. See, God gave them dominion. He gave them authority. You were made like me, so take care, cultivate, create, do things with what I have created. He trusted Adam and Eve. But in this partnership, he did warn them of one thing that could mess up their arrangement. And so in Genesis chapter 2, it goes on. It says, Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to cultivate it and keep it. And then he commanded them, saying, From any tree, any tree of the garden, you may eat freely all you want. But... From the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat from it, you will surely die. Adam and Eve were given a choice. They were given a choice to enjoy all that God had created them for them in full freedom. The only regulation was just don't do this because when you do, you'll die. You will have knowledge that is beyond what I want you to have. I want you to live in the freedom of all that I've given you. I've created a good thing for you. You don't need to deal with all of this. Let me deal with that. But as humanity, you know, enjoys to be curious, in Genesis chapter 3, things began to shift. It says, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, there was, there was something good about that fruit. It, it looked appealing. And then it was delightful to her eyes. And that the tree was desirable to make one wise. There was a benefit of growing in her understanding. So she took it and ate it and gave it to her husband and he ate it. And in that moment, their eyes were opened. And they recognized that they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made loin coverings. This is a moment in time where we stepped out of the goodness and the plan and the comfort that God gave us. And we took something of his as our own and we made it ours. And that is why for centuries, there was this back and forth toil between the created beings and the creator. God then lavished his love on one nation called Israel. And he said, I'm going to pour out all of my love and my affection towards you so that the whole world might see that there's a God that loves them, that created them. And I'm going to protect you, but I'm going to ask you to do it my way. I'm going to give you some rules, some regulations, and I'm going to ask you to do it the way that I want it to be done. But we didn't do that. And so there was this tension. There was this reaction that happened. And for some of you that maybe live in that scientific world, you would understand this as Newton's third law. For every action, there is an equal or opposite reaction. And so what that means for us is humanity's sin, humanity's choice to go outside of God's will came with a price. There was another reaction that had to be had. And so this is where most people don't like Christianity. They don't like the reality that there is a choice and there's a price that has to be paid. For me, I mean, to be honest, if I look at it from a different perspective, I'm a glutton. Welcome. Nice to meet you, okay? I love Ben and Jerry's pint-sized ice creams. I can eat a whole tub by myself, no problem. Half-baked, Tonight Show cookie dough, all of the good ones, fish swirl. You guys get it, okay? 
A pint of Ben and Jerry's ice cream is about 1,500 calories, and it is amazing. You put it in the microwave for 11 seconds so it's a little creamy, you know, and you just polish that sucker off while you watch Netflix. It's unbelievable, okay? I know that eating a bowl of Ben and Jerry's ice cream is much worse for me on the caloric density and scale than eating a bowl of broccoli is every night. I mean, just steamed broccoli by itself, a bowl, 100 calories. Ben and Jerry's ice cream, delight, joy, goodness, 1,500 calories. I had to buy bigger pants yesterday because I like ice cream, okay? I'm being vulnerable with you all, okay? Accountability is coming my way. I'm changing it out for a bowl of broccoli. But this is where we like to argue this conversation. Why is God telling us what we're allowed to do? I don't want anybody to tell me what I want to do. And then we put limits and say, no, 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 Christianity's too narrow. You can't tell me that I'm only allowed to have that perspective. No, I want to be able to do things the way that I want to do. I don't want to have to owe somebody something or have a requirement or a sacrifice or something like that. I want to be able to eat ice cream whenever I want and not have to go buy big pants. Okay? <laughs> but the reality is if we zoom out again, every major world religion has a cost or a sacrifice, or a rule, or a regulation. Judaism has 613 mosaic laws to follow. Muslims have the five pillars of Islam that they need to walk down. Mormons have commandments and ceremonies and good works they need to fulfill. Hindus have three different separate ways to achieve salvation through rituals and ceremonies. Buddhists do chanting and pilgrimage and meditation and merit-making to be able to achieve enlightenment. And the list goes on and on and on. And the thing is, is every world religion, every major thing out there has some sort of sacrifice. Even the atheistic per per uh, perspective has the idea that there is nothing. So you're sacrificing any hope for a future beyond this life. See, other religions versus Christianity, there is a difference. And I want to show you. It says the success or salvation of these other religions depends on the acts or achievements of the person rather than the God or the higher power they serve. But Christianity is the exact opposite. It all relies on receiving the gift of grace and acceptance through one person named Jesus. Jesus changed everything. He opened the floodgates. He gave opportunity for those that weren't able to have opportunity. Jesus broke down the weight and the burden of religious hierarchy, especially for the broken, the marginalized, and the overlooked. And this is a really important thing for us to understand because Jesus himself claimed to be God in human form. And next week, we're going to dissect whether or not you believe Jesus is really God. But to, for today, we're going to live in that understanding. And so if Jesus is God in human form, that means we don't have to take somebody else's word for it anymore. We have the author. We have the perfecter. We have the individual first-person perspective on who God is, how he acts, who he interacts with, and what that means for all of us. And so in John chapter 14, verse 9, Jesus told his own disciple who had been following him, Philip. He says, I've been with you all this time, Philip, and yet you still don't know who I am. Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. So why are you asking me to show him to you? What he was trying to show Philip was, I'm all you need to see. I am the complete and total embodiment of God for all people. And I want you to understand how I'm interacting with the world versus what you see. The context of when Jesus lived is he lived in a Jewish society that was being ruled by Roman government. There was an odds between the Jewish people and the Romans because they saw things differently. One was dominating the other. And then even in the own Jewish culture, there was people, Pharisees and Sadducees, religious hierarchy that, that put the burden 
on individuals to follow the Mosaic laws, to live within the sacrifices, to do the things that they were told to do based on Scripture. But Jesus came to actually show them some of the areas they were wrong. And he came in to break down the barrier and showcase to everybody that God's love was not just available for those who followed the rules, but it was available for everybody that chose to follow him. And to be honest, many Christians today take the posture of the Pharisees of old. And, and we've put a burden on people to be perfect creatures in order to be able to come close to God. And that is why so many people believe that Christianity has such a narrow worldview. But I want to showcase a couple ideas, a couple interactions that Jesus had with people to kind of break this down. One of Jesus' followers, his name was Matthew. He was a Jewish tax collector, oxymoron, okay? He rejected his people, sided with the Romans to steal and take their money. And Jesus said, hey, why don't you follow me? Jesus chose him. But then on the other side, you have Simon. Simon was a zealot. He was part of a, a basically a terrorist organization that hated the Romans and anybody that opposed uh, specifically their view on Jewish law. And so he would go out and his goal was to kill all of those people. So Jesus saw him and said, hey, you look like a great guy to come follow me. Come join me and my Jewish tax collector friend. We'll do this together. Jesus chose him. On the road one day, Jesus saw another tax collector. His name was Zacchaeus, the most notorious fraud out there, the, the biggest manipulator and thief of them all. And he said, hey, I'd like to come have lunch with you today. Jesus chose Zacchaeus. One day, Jesus was off in the Samaritan village and uh, was out at the well and he met a woman who had been married five times, despised by her community, and a different ethnicity than his own Jewish people. The, the Samaritans were hated by the Jews. And Jesus announced his messiahship to her and asked that she go tell everybody about him. Jesus chose her. There was another moment where there was a woman who was caught in adultery. Talk about a vulnerable situation. She was brought out in front of everybody, and then the religious leader said, the, the Mosaic law says to stone her. What do you say, Jesus? And then he said, hey, how about anybody who's never sinned before, go ahead and throw the first stone. And clearly, all humanity has fallen short, so they all walked away pretty frustrated. But Jesus protected her. There was a Roman officer who, someone in his family was really sick and he pleaded with Jesus to heal them. Even though he didn't follow the Jewish laws, he understood who Jesus was. He was part of the oppressing political power over Jesus' very own people. But what did Jesus do? He healed his family. And as Jesus hung on a cross next to two people that deserved to be up there, one of them recognized who he was. And he said, would you remember me in your kingdom? And in that moment, Jesus said, you'll be with me. Jesus saved him. All of these people have something in common. They were brought into proximity with Jesus, exactly where they were. They were presented an opportunity to have dialogue, and he showed them a different perspective on life, and he gave them a choice to receive what he had for them. I saw this thing on Instagram or YouTube shorts, because that's my choice of what I like to look at when I'm mindlessly scrolling, and uh, there was a pastor that came up, and he was talking about an interaction that he had with a young man who he was trying to disciple and have conversations. And the young man said to him, he said, do I have to stop smoking weed to follow Jesus? And the pastor said, no. 
And the young man kind of was like, hang on, hang on, guys. Let me just make sure we're on the same page. Do I have to stop smoking weed? You know, marijuana, the drug, like, like, do I have to stop doing that to follow Jesus? And the pastor said, no. And the kid is just like, what? I don't, I don't understand. And he goes, can I ask you a question? So the pastor asked the young man, he goes, when you're going to go take a shower, do you get clean before you get in the shower? And he goes, no. And he goes, so, so you get into the shower dirty, and the shower makes you clean, correct? He goes, yeah. He goes, you can start following Jesus. And as you start following Jesus, he might show you the areas that are dirty and give you the opportunity to choose to make them clean. It's not about showing up to the scene looking all good. It's about being exactly where you're at today and stepping into the proximity of Jesus so he can show you the areas of your life that might need to be cleaned up. See, all religions come with a price. Every single scenario has to be turned around. See, Newton's first law says this. An object at rest remains at rest. But an object in motion remains in motion at a constant speed and in a straight line unless acted on by an unbalanced force. When we were in the garden, we were at rest with God. But when sin entered in, we had to leave his presence. And we began a journey away from God until an unbalanced force came in and gave us an opportunity to redirect us. Jesus is the unbalanced force that puts us back into alignment with the Father. Jesus is the payment for your sin for your wrongdoings, for your choices that are outside of God's will. He said it this way in John chapter 14, verse 6. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. So yes, Christianity is exclusive. Yes, we believe that Jesus is the only path. And yes, we believe that anybody who does not choose to follow him will spend eternity apart from him in a place called hell. But one thing that Christianity is not is it is not about rules. It's not about restrictions, and it's not about requirements. It is solely based on a relationship with Jesus. For all the people that we talked about above, and for all of us that are here today, it is a simple formula. We have proximity to Jesus, and a dialogue begins. We're seen exactly as we are. We receive some information from Jesus, and we get invited to choose a new way of life. And at that point, we have the freedom to choose and a choice to receive his love for us. See, I, I grew up in Hollywood my dad worked in the entertainment industry and, you know, the tabloids that were all printed out before the internet of like, oh, this guy kissed this person and he cheated on that one. And like, there's all these things and you never knew if it was verified by the source or anything like that. But growing up, one of the things that was really important to Hollywood were the red carpet events. The paparazzi would line up and they would take photos. Everybody would have Oscar parties and all these cool things. And being somebody whose dad worked in the industry, I had a little bit of a better perspective of what actually was taking on. My parents got the opportunity to go to the Oscars and actually see it firsthand. 
And what happens is, on the red carpet events, they go to a street in Los Angeles. It's a pretty boring street. It's, it's dirty. You've got unsheltered neighbors out there. There's a lot of trash. There's, there's a lot of things that wouldn't make this place all that exciting. But what do they do on those big events is they dress it up. They put a red carpet out. They build grandstands. They put all these lights and these glamorous things. And people line up for a chance to see what, what they can't access until they're invited to the party. And then the people that are walking on the carpet, they're like taking their photos. Ah! And, and they go into this environment that is exclusively for them. And man, there's so many people who yearn to just see what it looks like on the inside. And I remember my mom would always tell me like, oh, they're not that different from us. She uses this line, oh, they wipe their butts the same way we do. <laughs> and then I learned about bidets and I said, no, I don't think that's the truth, mom. <laughs> They got the nice stuff, okay? <laughs> but on that street in Los Angeles, outside of these events, it is really not, not that much excitement. There's small businesses and things out there, and I just, I just envision this, this shot where you've got all this glitz and this glamour and all these amazing things, and then you've got like a little small business next door, and, and I think that's where Jesus would have had his business probably was a little white store, a simple sign that said, are you tired? Are you hungry? Are you thirsty? Come on in and, and we'll give you rest. I've, I've got food in here for you that actually never runs out. And I, I've got the water that will quench your thirst. But the reality is, is everybody's too busy looking at all the glitz and the glamour and the, the makeup and the dresses. And so he realizes, you know what, they're all distracted. They're busy doing their thing out there. So he takes it upon himself and he begins to walk the line. And, you know, I just, I just envision him just, just gentle. Maybe he's got his little cardboard sign, like, you hungry? And he's just like looking like, no, okay, you're distracted, all right. Just, just keeps on walking, and then, and then somebody, somebody catches his eye, and he goes, hey, hey, what's your, what's your name? I mean, I already know it, but like, what's your name? <gasps> cool, I'm Jesus, yeah, nice to meet you. And, and I believe that they have this dialogue, and, and I can just imagine him going, hey, I, I've got a store right over there, and I, I know this stuff looks great, but like, it doesn't, it doesn't last. You, you want to you join me over here? And the reality is, is for all of us here today, at the end of our time, the world of red carpet experiences is waiting for us. And maybe you have been waiting in your life for that breakthrough moment. Maybe it's the next big event you're hoping to get invited to or that, that job promotion or that relationship or whatever it is and you've been seeking and looking for it. And but you just feel tired. And you're worn out. And maybe you're here today because you just go, I've looked everywhere else. Maybe this is the spot. And maybe you've heard things about God before. But you, you never actually heard it from Him, directly from Him. You didn't understand how much He loves you. How through all of creation, all He ever desired was a relationship with you. He never wanted to bog you down. His whole goal was that He could enjoy it with you. And so he, because of his great love, he paid the price that you owe. And he gives you a choice to choose him. And I wonder if 
You'll, you'll choose to get out of line and walk towards him. I know that you've heard things about him. But why don't you ask him for yourself? Maybe you have that question of, Jesus, are you really the only way? And I think his response would, to you would be, why don't you come follow me and find out for yourself? Would you join me on that journey? Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the reality of the fact that yes, there are prices that need to be paid because we went outside of your standards. But luckily for us, Jesus was the price. He was the one that paved the way. He was the one that showed us how to become back into alignment with you. He was that unbalanced force that we needed to drive us in the direction of your glory. So as we continue this conversation in our table groups and as we dive into what does it look like to see things from your perspective, would we recognize that it's not a narrow worldview, it's actually a very inclusive view. It's a, it's a view of love and acceptance and that you are the only way. So would you bless our community as we point our eyes towards you this week? In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Wasn't that a stirring message? Yes, it was. Isn't it nice that we can have a safe space to explore these types of big questions that we have about God. These types of questions are not meant for us to discuss, you know, or to to talk about in isolation with ourselves, but we're able to wrestle through these types of big questions in community. Isn't that exciting that we have an opportunity to do that? Yes. So let me invite you to take a next step. Go ahead and pull out your phone again and go to echo.church forward slash connect or go ahead and scan the QR code in front of you on the screen and click that check-in button. And right there, you can let us know what type of next step you'd like to do, whether you need prayer or whether you want to get baptized. We want to come alongside you in this journey that you may have and, and give you any resources and be of help to you in any way. What other next step can we have our friends do here? Yeah, actually one more thing I wanna mention about check-in that we forgot to mention is uh, during this whole series, every week when you check in, we've put together a list of resources specifically that speak into this message for you today to add to your exploration, to be able to support you in your journey of faith as well. So when you check in, you'll receive an email with a list of resources that help take this a little bit further into your life as well. Now, the other next step we talk about each week on Sundays here at Echo is the step of giving. And we do this every week, never out of pressure or guilt or obligation. It's part of our worship. We lift our praises to God with songs and singing, but we also give to Him out of surrender and saying that, God, everything that I have is yours. You know, this morning I was actually reading in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. The Apostle Paul was speaking to one of the churches that he started in the first century. He was telling to them uh, about this topic of generosity of giving. He says, anything that you give is acceptable when you do it eagerly. And so there's something about the posture of our hearts that when we give, we want to do it out of this place where we are 
eager to be a part of the work that God is doing, that we're not doing it because somebody is telling us to, we're not doing it because of any sort of pressure or any guilt on the inside to feel that we have to, but we do it because we are eager to worship God, that we are eager to partner with Him in the works that He is doing, not just in our church, but all around the world. So there's ways that you can give right here. You'll see it on the screens. You can scan that QR code as well. You can make it a part of your weekly worship with us, and uh, we'd love to be able to partner with with you that way as well and like I was saying the work that is happening through the church it's not just within our community it's not just within our campuses and our cities but there are things that are happening all around the world and I know you got the chance to be part of some things this year you went to Malawi and all that oh I definitely did I had that opportunity to go to Malawi and bring the love of Jesus learn from other people and share resources that we had and we don't just do it there in Africa we do it right here in the United States. We also do it in the Philippines, Indonesia, Mexico, Brazil, and Paris. You have a pretty strong connection to Paris, yeah, so right? I was actually, I was born and raised in France. So for me, it's really special that we have these opportunities coming up. In fact, we have interest meetings that are happening this week uh, on Zoom. You can join and be a part of that. All that is in your digital program, but we'd love for you to be able to explore all that's happening and consider joining one of these trips next year because we truly believe they are life-changing opportunities, not just for the work that we get to do in those places, but even in the impact that it has in our lives. And like she shared, there's a trip that goes to France. They've been going for a couple years now. They partner with this incredible ministry uh, that ministers to people through gospel music, which is the most interesting thing in a nation that is predominantly atheist, that they're able to minister people through this type of music. And we want to show you uh, the story of one of our team members who went this year to Paris to partner with that ministry from our Fremont campus. So check it out. The opportunity that I had was to visit Paris, yay, sing with a gospel choir, but also to reach a place that is so needing of God's grace and mercy. The majority of the population is either deist, diagnostic, uh, atheist, agnostic, a lot of spiritualism. Um, and the ministry that we partnered with is a Paris Gospel Church. Paris Gospel Church has also a choir, Paris Gospel Choir, that is separate from the church in that you do not have to be a believer in God to participate. And amazingly enough, people in Paris love gospel music. And if we can worship together, the more that they sing those songs, but the more that they hear those words praising God, those seeds are being planted every time they say those words. Those seeds are being planted and God's just cultivating a baby Christian as they listen to those worship songs. And so being able to partner with Paris Gospel Choir in order to give my own testimony was just a way for God to use me and my story for His glory. We went on this weekend uh, retreat where we uh, rehearsed for the concert and you sit with different people that you don't know. Thank God they speak English. Is <laughs> my par my uh, French is just very very bad. So, but I was able to give my testimony and that connection. You know, they are receiving your story. They are receiving your faith, and they are accepting it. And you can feel God moving in, in that space. And afterwards, I found out that almost 20 people are close to giving their lives to God. And to me, that's a huge number. That's 20 more people that will build the house for the glory of Jesus, and I'm just so excited about that. Amen. That's very exciting. So now, if that excites you, then we want you to make sure that you participate in the interest meeting that we have coming up on November 19th. It's a Zoom meeting, so you don't have to leave your house, but you can definitely participate, and you can find out more about that right there through your digital program. All right, and that wraps up our time together for today. Make sure you come back next week. We're unpacking another huge question during our series of Explore God. We're talking about, is Jesus really God? You're going to want to find out. So come back next Sunday. We'll see you all. Have a great see rest you of your week. Hub. See you next time.
Hey everybody, welcome to Echo Church. My name is Tim, I'm the Church Online Pastor here and I'm just thrilled to be able to welcome you to our Church Online experience. I, I hope you're able to connect and enjoy the service, engage. I hope that the message will speak to you, uh, that the songs that we sing together will point you towards God. We've designed this whole experience with you in mind today, that it would encourage you in your next steps and in your journey towards God. And in this season as a church, as we're going through a series called Explore God, that's really the hope and desire for all of it. That at the end of the day, that you will be able to take a step closer towards the life that God desires for you and your understanding of who He is. So we've got a lot of great things planned for today. Uh, we have a digital program. If you go to echo.church forward slash connect, uh, there you'll be able to engage with us and follow with message notes, check in, let us know your next steps. We've got great resourcing that we're giving alongside during this series that go with that series. we got a podcast that we put together. It's here already on our YouTube channel. You can check it out. Uh, all kinds of other things, books that we're recommending, other videos, blog posts, and etc. that go along with each of the messages during this series that you can follow along with. So make sure uh, that you do so as well. Also want to encourage you, we got an amazing team in our chats. They're there to engage with you, answer any questions, remind you of these next steps that we're talking about. Do engage with them there. And at the end of our service, uh, I'll actually be coming back online uh, for us if you want to connect. If you want a chance to meet, I'd love to get an opportunity to meet you and to connect with you. Uh, and so here's a Zoom link right there. If you go to echo.church slash lobby group, that's our little after service hangout. Our team will be there as well. We'd love to connect with you during that service uh, or at the end of that service together. But for now, we're gonna go back to our time of worship. So let's join in. Echo Church, we're glad you're here. Come on, stay with us. Let's put our hands together. We're gonna learn a new song today. The Bible says that the joy of the Lord is our strength.
the sound I love to hear. It's the sound of the Savior's robe as he walks into the room where people pray, where we hear praise as he hears faith. There is a sound. There is a sound I love to hear. It's the sound of the Savior's robe as he walks into the room where people pray, where we hear worship, he hears faith. Come on, church, we sing away. Oh, I pray my soul and sing. Sing his praise aloud. We sing his praise aloud. Oh, I wake my soul and sing. Sing his praise aloud. We sing his praise aloud.
Would you close your eyes with me? The scriptures teach us that God is merciful and compassionate. It says that he is slow to anger and he's filled with unfailing love. We're just going to take a minute right now and just let him love on each one of us. We welcome you, almighty God creator of it all and lover of our souls. We welcome you, God. Yeah, would you speak today? God, would you meet us where we're at today? God, each one of us, we walk into this room with different things going on, and you know exactly what we need. God, you know what we need. You know what we're longing for. God, you know the deepest desire of every heart, and I thank you today that you are able to do infinitely and abundantly beyond anything we could hope for or imagine. And so today we come just as we are. God, we're not here to act anything in front of you. We're not here to be someone we're not. We're here just as we are, and we invite you now to speak to us, the very God who put the breath inside of our lungs. Thank you today that we get to encounter your love right here and right now. We love you and we welcome you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Come on, can we thank him today? Oh, it's so good to be here with you. So glad that you're here. Welcome to Echo Church. Thank you for joining along with us. You guys sound awesome today. Very, very good. Hey, would you go ahead and have a seat? You can say hello to your neighbor as you do. Good morning, Echo Church. Good morning, all of you who are joining us online. You guys are the true faithful ones. I heard the 49ers are playing right now, and you guys are here, so we love you. Uh, hey, thanks so much for joining us. My name is Tim. I'm the church line pastor. Thrilled for all of you online streaming, joining us right now, and of course, all of you in the room as well. Yes, and my name is Laverne Niles, and I am an apprentice with Echo School of Leadership. Yes, thank you so much, thank you so much. All right, so what I would love to invite you to do is I would like for you to pull out your mobile device. All right, I'm watching, I'm just making sure everybody's doing it. That way, okay, and I would like you to go to echo.church forward slash connect, or you can scan the QR code on the chair right in front of you, or you can actually scan the QR code that's right there on the screen. We want you to be able to access our digital program because it is chock full of resources for you to be able to access, including our message notes. I love those message notes. Want to know what else is exciting? You can save those message notes. If you click save up in the top right corner of your phone, you can save it and go back to it for later. Nice. That's a good pro tip right there. Uh, hey, another thing we just want to acknowledge is we know every single week at Echo, whether online or here in our spaces, that people are showing up at church for the very first time. And we know showing up anywhere for the first time can be a little intimidating and scary, and church is no different. And so we're so glad that you're here. We want to welcome you. We want to say, man, we're thrilled that you're here, really, honestly. And we actually want to bless you for being here. Uh, so after our service, swing by in the lobby at the hub. It's where the, the red wall is. You'll see those tables. We have a free gift to give to you. So make sure you swing by at the end of our time so we can give that to you just as our way of saying thank you for joining us. Now you'll also notice in your digital program, there's a few things in there, but one of them says join the dream team. And Laverne, you got the jersey on already, so you're good to go. I do. Oh, hold up. Y'all got to see the whole thing. Yes, yeah, so we want to invite you guys to come out and join the dream team. 
What is the Dream Team, Laverne? Well, the Dream Team is like a team of awesome volunteers that are passionate about service. And what we want to do is we want you to come on board. If you are pursuing purpose, if you're like, what can I do? How can I get involved? Well, that's how you can get involved. You can become a Dream Teamer like me. And you can access the invitation right there in your digital program. But you want to know what else? We like to celebrate service. So if you join the Dream Team, you can join us at our big Dream Team party that's happening on Wednesday, November 1st. Don't forget to sign up. All right. Well, hey, we're really thrilled to be able to continue this journey together that we've been on through a series called Explore God. And during the series, we're joining with hundreds of other churches in the Bay Area, asking the big questions of life, faith, and meaning. We're thrilled to be able to welcome our very own campus pastor, yeah. Stephen Zyer, here to bring the message, asking the key question, is Christianity too narrow? I know this is a question all of us have asked or wrestled with. Can't wait for you all to hear this message after this short video. Why were we put here? I think everyone wants to know, why were we put here? Why are we on earth? They put it this way, I, I like, I'd like to think that God is real. The Bible, <laughs> that's controversial. <laughs> Thank you for asking. Why would anybody want to create people who do horrible things to each other? Does it make any sense? I was raised atheist. I don't believe in a higher power, but I also don't claim to know everything about the world. One of my favorite things to do when I was younger was convince people of things that were not true and then shame them for being gullible. I don't know if you've ever been the victim of one of those stories, but it's really fun to know the truth and then make people feel deceived on the other side. Now, I thought that this was fun as a kid because I think it was part of my storyteller gift that uh, flourished as I got older, but uh, I don't plan on lying you to you today, so hopefully that you feel comfortable with that. But uh, there are other people who appreciate my love of this kind of art form, and one of them created a newspaper called The Onion. And The Onion just produces a bunch of satire articles where they go and they try to make light of things that are going on in the world, or they make fun of things that are going on in the world to try to convince people of things that are actually not true. Well, in 2012, they were very successful. When The Onion claimed Kim Jong-un was the sexiest man alive. <laughs> it was a great article, and let me read one of the taglines. It said, with his devastatingly handsome round face, his boyish charm, and his strong, sturdy frame, this Poyong-bred heartthrob is every woman's dream come true. And they did a great job of producing this article, so much so that China's largest newspaper picked it up as fact. And they ran the story, and they convinced all of China that North Korea's leader was the sexiest man alive. And uh, it was covered by CNN and ABC News, making fun of it afterwards. But um, not always is information light and easy like that. On January 13th of 2018, the Hawaiian Island residents and visitors received a text message that said this, ballistic missile threat inbound to Hawaii. Seek immediate shelter. This is not a drill. So for 38 minutes and 13 seconds, people all over the island thought that doom was headed their way. It caused a lot of frantic, emotional decisions from a lot of people. Some even took their lives instead of experiencing what was coming their way. Actor Jim Carrey was on the island visiting during that time, and his assistant called him and said, hey, boss, it's been great working for you. We have 10 minutes left. And he didn't understand what was happening, and he checked his phone. So he went out on the deck of his 
home and he just looked out of the ocean and he just tried to be grateful for the moments that he had. Well, it was a mistake that was made by somebody else and it caused a lot of turmoil for a lot of people. I wonder if you yourself have ever had a moment like that where you believed something to be true only to find out it wasn't true. Maybe it was information about a family member. Maybe it was something related to your job or the stock market. Or maybe it was about something that someone else said about you from a third party source only to find out it wasn't real. This happens to us all the time. The information you received was not actually verified by the author for its validity. You might be wondering, Stephen, why are you telling us these stories or why are you bringing up this point? And I just want to address the fact that sometimes we hear things and believe that they are true, blindly acting in faith and believing the source of where it came. However, for many of us, when it comes to God, so many people blindly listen to what other people's perspectives are on God, rather than exploring what the author himself actually has to say about who he is. I, I know in my journey of faith for a long time, I believed what other people said about God. And it wasn't until I did the research myself, I found out some of the things that I had believed because of what other folks had said were completely wrong. In fact, they were contrary to what the Bible actually said. And the reality is, is for many people who follow Jesus, we don't take the extra measure to find out what he says. So you take maybe a friend's word as truth. You, you trust me as a pastor or somebody else that you saw on Instagram instead of actually going through the process of verification for your own. I just want to encourage you that I've studied hard for this message, but at any point you can verify for your own well-being to make sure I'm not leading you in a direction that's different from God. It's actually a biblical practice that we see in the book of Acts. So, in a way to help us collectively see what God has to say about himself, I felt like it might be good for us to look at a passage where God actually says who he is. Now for context, the leader of the Israelites, his name is Moses, is up on a mountain with God. And he has been begging God, I want to see you, I want to know you, I want to be with you. And God says, I will let you see a part of who I am as I pass by. And as he passes by, God himself says these words about who he is. And these are the words that come to us from Exodus chapter 34, verse 6 and 7. It says, the Lord passed in front of Moses calling out, Yahweh, the Lord. This is his description about himself. The God of compassion and mercy. I am slow to anger and filled with unfailing love and faithfulness. I lavish unfailing love to a thousand generations. I forgive iniquity, rebellion, and sin, but I do not excuse the guilty. I lay the sins of the parents Upon their children and grandchildren, the entire family is affected, even children in the third and fourth generations. I wonder, as you hear those words, are they consistent with your perspective on who God is? Maybe there's some aspects that you didn't understand. Maybe there's some things that you've always believed. I wonder if, like me, you like a part of the description and maybe not all of another part. 
We all love to go like, oh, God's so compassionate and merciful. He's going to forgive me. I know. I'm just a helpless human. But then we don't like the part of like, my great grandkids are going to have to deal with my crap. Like, no, that's not fair to them. Like, put it all on me, right? We don't like that part of it. And to be honest, because we see God as loving and compassionate, but he's also a just and merciful and hard judge, we we get this narrative built around Christianity of like, you got to be perfect. You got to like follow all the rules to like get in or like you got to be this perfect little person, cookie cutter, boring prude in order to live life, right? And then this narrative comes through and it says like, oh, Christians, they're narrow in their worldview. They don't really see things from a broader perspective because there's these cookie cutter little people. And so that is why there's a lot of folks that ask the question, is Christianity too narrow for the 2020s? Does it fit into the world that we live in today? And there's a lot of great conversation that can be had around this specific question. And we don't have time to address every point today, but I hope that this week you will dive into your table groups and have these conversations. But there are a few questions of reflection that come up often in this area, and I just want to put them out there. And one of them is, how can we claim that Christianity is the only way that is right? Another one is, why can't there be many ways to God? If I want to drive to Los Angeles, I can go 101, I can go 5, I can fly, I can take a train. There's many ways, and I can get to the same destination, right? How can so many people and nations be wrong? And then how can God be good if he's so exclusive? Now, these are really important questions, but I want us to look a little bit different today. I want us to see it from a different angle rather than our objective reasoning. I want it to look at us, I want us to look at it from a perspective of God's love for us and his interaction with us over the course of human history. See, as Christians, we believe that in the beginning of time, God created this world. He created us in his image to share in the good things that he created. He desired more than anything for us to be in relationship with him, enjoying the things that he created. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, it says this, So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply. I love those four words. You guys know what I'm saying, right? It's a great command from God. Be fruitful and multiply. If it takes a little bit of time, you'll get there, okay? Um, He says, fill the earth and govern it. Reign over the fish in the sea the birds in the sky, and the animals that scurry along the ground. God gave his creation, Adam and Eve, authority to rule over all other things that he created. He wanted to have a joint partnership with them. And anytime you have a partnership with somebody, there's vows that are created. There are some things that you say to one another to know that the commitment level is there. And so that's what God did. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 15, he says, he took the man and he put him in the Garden of Eden to cultivate it and keep it. And then he commanded the man and he said, from any tree of the garden, you may eat freely, but from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. You shall not eat, for in that day you will surely die. This was the clause in the partnership agreement. We will share in everything, but this tree is exclusive to me. I have the knowledge of good and evil. I don't want you to worry about that. I want you to help manage and do this stuff, and I'll take care of that stuff. You worry about what I've created here in union, in partnership with me. 
So the choice was up to Adam and Eve. They could enjoy everything God created in full partnership with him, or they could choose to nullify that contract, nullify that partnership, and go against God's warning. And if you've read the story or if you've lived for more than five seconds, you will understand that is what we did. So in Genesis chapter 3, it says, When the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes, it wasn't like this was an evil thing. It, it was appealing. And it was appealing because the tree was desirable to make her wise. She would gain more knowledge. She would have more insight. But that insight was exclusively designed to be for God. So she took it and she ate it and she gave it to her husband and he ate it. And then in a moment, they had the same knowledge as God and they recognized that they were naked. That concept before was completely foreign to them. So they fi- sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. This is the moment in human history where the created beings became at odds with their creator. And he desired so desperately to be back into relationship with them that he made a way. He, he said, I'm going to pour out my love and affection on the Israelite community so everyone in the world will know how much I love them by what I do for them. But there is some rules and some partnerships that we need to come alongside to here together. And so I like to, to just stop to recognize there was a cost that had to be paid because they went outside of the rules of the agreement that was originally formed. And so if you are maybe in scientific thinking process, maybe that's where you kind of live, you would know this kind of as Newton's third law. For every action, there is an equal or opposite reaction. So essentially, humanity's sin, choosing to go outside of God's will, came with a price. And I want to pause here for just a moment. Because a lot of people don't like this idea that there's a price that has to be paid. They don't like the fact that we have to sacrifice to be right with God. Like, he's the one that created. Why do we have to go through the pain? But I don't write all the rules. One of the rules I don't write, and I'm not a fan of, is the fact that ice cream doesn't have the same calories as broccoli. Okay? I love Ben and Jerry's pint-sized ice creams, okay? You put it in the microwave for 11 seconds, it gets a little creamy, and you sit there and you watch Netflix or a sports game, and you eat the whole dang thing, okay? Vulnerability, I like ice cream. I had to buy bigger pants last night, so it's a wake-up call, okay? Now, each pint is about 1,500 calories. I know, it's ridiculous. A bowl of broccoli is like a hundred. Why don't they taste the same? Okay. Why is all of the Tonight Show cookie dough and half-baked and fish food, why is it so much better than just steamed broccoli? But I make the choice to eat it because it tastes better. It's good. But I also don't write the rules on how digestion and calories work inside of my body, so therefore I bought bigger pants. Okay? There's a price that had to be paid. Old Navy made $40 for my choices of Ben and Jerry's. Okay? And we, this is like, this makes sense to us, but we love to argue that God's not allowed to tell me I can't do that. No, 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 no. But the reality is we don't write the rules. But we love to tell God what he's allowed to do and what's okay and what's not okay if it fits into our narrative. I would love to say that if I eat a bowl of Ben and Jerry's every single night, I will lose weight. But that is not the reality of the situation per the new pants, okay? And, and a lot of people will go like, see, Christianity is so limited in their view. But there is a reality that every major world religion 
has a cost associated with it. Judaism, they have 613 Mosaic laws they need to follow. Those from the Muslim faith have the five pillars of Islam. Mormons have commandments and ceremonies and good works that they need to fulfill. The Hindus have three separate ways to achieve salvation that comes with rituals and ceremonies. Buddhists have chanting and pilgrimage, merit-making to achieve enlightenment. Atheists forego the whole idea of a life after death and no hope for the future. See, everybody has a cost. But the difference between other religions and Christianity is this. Success depends on the acts or the achievements of the person rather than the God or the higher power they serve. We like to be able to say, like, if I do X, Y, Z, I get what I want. But if I don't want to do it, it doesn't mean I miss out. It just means maybe I don't get that level or I don't get to that enlightenment or I don't, I don't get to do it as far as maybe that person, but I'm still going to enjoy my here and my now. But Christianity is on the opposite side of that. It all relies on the gift of grace and acceptance through a man named Jesus. Jesus, he changed everything for everyone. He actually came and he broke down the weight and the burden of religious hierarchy. And he did it especially for the broken, the marginalized, and the overlooked. Now, Jesus is an important figure because he claimed to be God. He claimed that he himself was the total embodiment of God. The same God that we read about in Exodus, Jesus was him in physical form. Now, we're going to discuss next week whether or not you believe Jesus is God. But for today, we're just going to use that as our anchor statement, that Jesus is himself God. So if that statement is true, that means we don't have to take somebody else's word for it anymore. We get to see how he, as a man, interacted with everybody else on the planet through the biographies called the Gospels. Now, Jesus said this about himself, just so we can understand the words that he spoke. This is to one of his own followers, Philip. He had been talking a lot about the Father in heaven, and everyone's like, I want to see the Father, I want to see the Father. And so Jesus says this to Philip. He says, have I been with you all this time, Philip, and yet you still don't know who I am? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. So why are you asking me to show him to you? See, Jesus was the total embodiment of God. He was the one that created an opportunity for so many others to experience the kingdom of God. But if we think about the context of where Jesus was, there was a lot of folks that were running the Jewish system that weren't the most loving to outsiders. In fact, they were probably known more for their judgment towards others because they were upholding their religious standards and fighting on behalf of God that they actually pushed down many others to make themselves feel better. And that's part of the reason a lot of people in this world don't like Christians and think we have too much of a narrow worldview because we're the ones that are pushing burden and hierarchy on everybody else. But I want to show you Jesus didn't come to applaud them, say, yep, these guys are right. No, he actually came to set the captives free, to heal the sick, to release those who were in bondage. And I want to give you a couple examples of who Jesus welcomed into his circle and how he fought against this ideal of being a cookie cutter person. So here's just a couple examples. One of Jesus' very own followers who he called, his name was Matthew. Matthew was a Jewish tax collector. 
Those are oxymorons, okay? Because the Jews did not like taxes that were being opposed on them from the Romans. And so a Jewish tax collector is somebody who rejected his Judaism to side with the oppressing power and steal money from his own very people. But Jesus chose Matthew. Now on the other side, because they didn't like taxes, there was Simon. Simon was the, a zealot. He was part of a, a very uh, fundamentalist religious organization on the Jewish side of things, going against everybody that was on the Roman side of things or not living exactly to God's standards. And they were known for killing and assassinating those types of people. But Jesus saw him and said, hey, you should come be with me too and my Jewish tax collector friend. Let's do this thing together, right? And so Jesus chose him. Now one day as everybody's walking along the road and Jesus is out there and they're like, I love you, Jesus. He sees Zacchaeus, a wee little man who was up in a tree. Now Zacchaeus, he was the most notorious tax collector. He was the one that was known as the master manipulator, the big house on the hill. And Jesus saw him and said, today I want to be with you and have lunch with you. The whole crowd is like, what the heck? But Jesus chose Zacchaeus. Now, if we go away from men for a little while, now women were not a high priority in the society back in Jesus' day. They were lower than men. That's not our view here. Don't worry. Don't start throwing things at me. Okay? But back then, okay, they were broken too. Okay? So Jesus decided... I'm going to find the best woman to announce that I'm the Messiah to. So he goes into Samaritan territory, which was like hated by his people, the Jews. And then he found the woman who was pretty much hated by her society because she had been around town a little too much. So she was out at the well and he like starts talking to her and he's like, yeah, I know you've been with five men. It's all that good. Like I'm the Messiah. And she's like, what? Like, and he's like, yeah. And he's like, hey, can you go tell everybody? See, Jesus chose her to bring his message of hope and salvation to the people that his people hated. Then there was a woman who was caught in adultery. Talk about a vulnerable situation. And she was brought out to town, naked and vulnerable in front of everybody else, and then the religious elite said, hey, the Mosaic law, the Jewish law, Jesus, that you said that you follow says she deserves to be stoned to death for what she did. So Jesus says, how about this? How about the first person who's never sinned can throw the first stone? And so they all drop their stones and walk away. Jesus protected her. And then there was a Roman officer, not aligned with Jesus whatsoever. He was actually part of the oppressing folks that pushed down the Jews. But he recognized Jesus as, as the power. And he, he had someone in his family that was sick. And he begged him if he could just say the words, his family member would be healed. So even though they didn't align on everything or even their positions or the nationality, Jesus healed his family. And then as Jesus hung on the cross next to two crooks, one of them recognized him and said, you must be God. Would you please remember me? And so Jesus saved him. Christianity might have a narrow lane, but the invitation is very wide. See, all of these people had their own set of problems. And they met Jesus. He presented what he had to offer and gave them a choice to receive the freedom and walk with him. One of my things that I like to blow off time is scrolling through Instagram and YouTube shorts. And the other day I came across a pastor on there who was giving this example. And he said, a young man that he was talking about the faith with asked him, hey, pastor, if I want to follow Jesus, do I have to stop smoking weed? And the pastor said, no. And the guy was like, hang on, hang on, let me, let me make sure we're on the same like, page here. If I want to follow Jesus, do I have to stop smoking weed like marijuana, like that? And he goes, 
No. And the young man's like, oh, flabbergasted. Like, I, I don't get it. And he goes, let me ask you a question. He goes, when you go to get in the shower, do you get clean before you get in the shower? The young man goes, no. He goes, so when you start following Jesus, you might be dirty. But as you follow him, he will show you the ways in which you can get clean. See, you don't have to come to Jesus perfectly buttoned up to figure it out. No, he wants you just as you are. And as you get to know him a little bit, you will start to realize there might be some parts of me that are dirty. But Jesus gives you all that you need to make yourself clean. See, if we go back to Newton, we recognize that there was a reaction that happened as a result of our sin. And Newton's first law is actually this, an object at rest remains at rest. See, when we were in the garden, we were in rest. We were in God's presence. But then an object in motion remains in motion at a constant speed and in a straight line unless it is acted on by an unbalanced force. When sin entered the equation, we began a constant journey away from God. And unless something else showed up and redirected us, an unbalanced force, we were going to continue our motion away from God. But Jesus is that unbalanced force. Jesus is the greater force that could stop us and redirect us back to our Father, bringing us that rest we so desire. Jesus is the payment for your sins. He's the one that says, I know you broke the partnership agreement. I get it. But, but I'm the true owner of the company, and so I, I, I got an extra clause that I can come in. Why, why don't I make things right again? This is what he said when he said, I am the way, I'm the truth, and I'm the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. So yes, Christianity is exclusive. Yes, we claim that Jesus is the only path to salvation. And yes, we claim that unless you choose that path, for all of eternity, you will be separate apart from God in a place called hell. But I do want to say that Christianity is not about rules. It's not about restrictions. It's not about requirements. It is about a relationship with Jesus. And throughout his life and all that we get to see, yes, we understand the path to follow him might be narrow. But the invitation is so wide. The invitation is for everybody. All of those people that interacted with Jesus, they had proximity to him, which opened up a dialogue. And in that dialogue, he presented who he was, exactly where they were. And he gave them an invitation that said, would you join me in this journey and discover a new way to live the life that was always intended for you? And it was their freedom to experience that. Growing up, uh, my dad worked in Hollywood. And this was back before the internet where you get all the tabloids and all the things that tell you all about all the famous people that you see on movies. And so you would believe a lot of the stuff that was happening. But one of the things that was really popular back in my day was the red carpet events. I mean, there was a couple events, the Academy Awards, the Golden Globes, the Oscars, the Grammys, where you'd have all these really special people 
that get an exclusive invitation to the red carpet events. And they would take these dirty, grungy streets in Hollywood and they would cover them up with velvet ropes and red carpets and all these lights and paparazzi would make it seem so appealing. But if you zoom out, it's really just an ugly street in Los Angeles. Gum on the ground, trash everywhere, piss and stuff all over from people that have been walking around. But the perception is really amazing. Now, lucky for me, my parents, because of my dad's profession, actually got invited to a couple of these events. Oh my gosh, wow, so cool. Your parents were the red carpet. Yep, they have faults too. Um, and my mom used to always tell me, like, ah, it's not that special. Like, it's a cool thing, but it's really not that cool. Like, all the people you see on the red carpet, they're the same as us. She told us growing up, yeah, they wipe their butts the same way that we do. <laughs> and then I learned about bidets, and I said, Mom, you're wrong. They have the fancy stuff. Still saving up, but... Uh, but, but what we see on these things is this exclusive environment only for a few, and our attention is like, oh, I wish I could get on that carpet one day. And as I was processing this idea of Christianity being too narrow, I thought about that environment and how exclusive it is. There's security, there's all this stuff. You can't get on it without an invitation. But all the, all the businesses that are right next to this event in L.A. are still open. Like people can walk up and down the streets outside of the gated off area. And I just imagine Jesus is like this little small business owner. He's got this tiny little hole in the wall shop. He's got a sign outside advertising that says, are you tired? Are you hungry? Are you thirsty? Come on in and we'll give you rest. We, we have food you don't even know about in this place. And man, the water that we have in here, it will quench your thirst forever. But everybody's so distracted by the red carpet. And they don't see his clever marketing, you know, his, his nifty, witty self. So he's like, you know what? I'll take it upon myself. I'm going to go out there. I'm going to walk the line. Because that's where people are at. Like, I'll go find them. And I think he probably is like walking around. Maybe he's got a little cardboard sign like, you tired? Like, and he's like looking, trying to see if he can make eyes with people, you know, that someone you're trying to find. Like, are they looking at me? Am I looking at them? Like, he's walking the line like, hey. And like, nobody's really looking at him because they're all paying attention. And then he catches the eye of one. He's like, hey. Hi. Hey. My name is Jesus. Hey, what's your name? I mean, I already know, but like, hey, it's so good to meet you. I'm like, hey, um, are, you, are you fulfilled in this? No, no, <laughs> I knew you wouldn't be. It's all good, all right. Um, uh, I, I, actually, I have a shop right over here. You, I got food, I got water, I got like all the things that you might need. Would you, would you like to come check it out? Oh, no, it's all on me. No, no, no money, because I know you're in debt. It's okay, don't worry about it, okay? <laughs> um, yeah, you've been out of a job for a while. Don't worry, it's okay. Uh, come, you want to come on over? A dialogue begins. They're presented with a choice to make. The world of red carpet experiences is out there waiting for us. And maybe that's what you've been waiting for. Your next big break or that event or that promotion or that thing, that relationship but you realize you're really not feeling all that fulfilled like many of the people that are on the red carpet. And maybe you're here today because you've heard things about God, but you've never actually directly heard it from him or how much he loves you and what he did and the price that he paid to be with you by dying a sinner's death on the cross. But now you have a choice to make. I wonder if you'll get out of the line and start walking towards Jesus. 
I, I know that you've heard things about him. I know that you might have thought it was so narrow. But like we've learned, the invitation is so wide. So why don't you ask him for yourself? Jesus, are you really the only way? I think his response would be, come follow me and see for yourself. Let's pray. Father, thank you for all of these people that are here today. The individuals that are seeking a conversation with you. And I know that in our world, we've, we've been fed this lie that the road to you is so narrow. But what we've seen through your life, Jesus, and the example that you give is that the invitation is so wide. And that you don't need us to get cleaned off before we come follow you. You want us just as we are. So would you guide us into a conversation that allows us to see you the right way? And would we be the type of people that change our world by seeing it through your eyes? In Jesus' name. That was a really stirring message. And maybe you're still feeling that stirring on the inside. That's the Holy Spirit speaking to you. But maybe you're ready to take a step toward that invitation. Maybe you're ready to say, yes, I want to follow you, Jesus. Well, if you're ready to do that, go ahead and pull out your mobile device so that you can check in. Go through that digital program and click on the check-in button. And right there at the bottom, you can click the button that says, I'd like to give my life to Jesus. But what if you're not there yet? What if you're not ready? You don't have to make that choice yet. There's also a box where you can put in any prayer request that you may have. In the Word, there was a man who was getting prayer for his son and he said, you know, Lord, I believe, but I need some help with my unbelief. Maybe you want to put that there. You know, maybe you're just not ready, but you need some prayer about it. Go ahead and put that there. That way our team can come alongside you and we can pray for you. So go ahead and do that right there. Yep, we're waiting. That's awesome. <laughs> Well, one thing also that's helpful for you in this journey and this time when you check in together and something we want to encourage all of you to do is when you check in, we've put together a whole list of resources that go along with the content of what we're talking about today. So each week we're catering and we're designing a set of resources just for you to go along with this message. We do a podcast specifically for this uh, that's related today. We're sharing extra videos or blogs. Uh, books that we recommend along these things. So make sure you check it out. When you check in, you'll get an email with all that information as well. One of the other next steps that we highlight every single week here at Echo is the step of generosity. Every week we take a time to really continue in our worship through our giving. It's something we never do out of guilt or obligation or any sort of pressure as a church. For us, it really comes from that posture in our hearts. Actually, this morning I, I was reading in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Uh, the Apostle Paul, who helped start that church. Uh, and he was speaking to them about this very subject. This is in the first century. And he was telling them about this posture of generosity. He says, any gift that you give is acceptable. He said, if it is done eagerly. And there's something about our posture in the way that we give that actually really does matter to God that we're not doing it because somebody is telling us to, because I'm feeling this guilty feeling in my heart, because if I feel like this is the thing I need to do or the box I need to check, but that there's an eagerness in my heart 
to want to worship God and believing that everything I have actually already belongs to him. An eagerness in my heart to want to partner with him and believe the amazing things that he wants to do in and through my life because of my generosity, because I get to partner with him. So when you give today, that's the posture we want to have. There's many ways that you can participate in that. You can find the links right there on the digital program. You can use the envelopes on the backs of your chairs. You can scan the codes. There's even ways to give via crypto uh, or uh, stocks as well. Whatever way makes sense for you, we just want to know that we'd be grateful for you to partner with us in that way and to partner with God in the works that he's doing. And the works that God is doing here through ECHO, it's not just for our community here. It's not just for those in our campuses or our region, not even just in our nation, but there are things that are happening all around the world through ECHO. Even you got to be part of what's happening in Malawi earlier this year. I sure did. I had the opportunity to travel with a team from right here from ECHO to go over to Malawi, Africa, to bring the good news of Jesus Christ, to learn from other cultures and to share the resources that we had. But we don't just do that, like Pastor Tim said, across the world. We do that here also in the United States. And then check out some other places that we also go to. We go to the Philippines, we go to Indonesia, Brazil, Mexico, and even Paris. You have a special connection to yeah, Paris. Yeah, I actually, I was born and raised in France. And so this is like close to my heart and dear to my family. Uh, my parents are actually the one that lead this trip. So we're sending trips to all of these nations coming up next year in 2024. And so we're preparing for these trips right now. And there's even an interest meeting that's happening this coming week that you can RSVP for. You'll find all the details. It's on Zoom. You can learn about any of those trips, ask questions, explore what it'd be like. Those trips are life-changing, uh, not just for the ministry we get to do for the people who are there, but even for our own lives. Everybody who goes on one of these trips, and you can attest that I'm sure, Laverne, that you become transformed by those experiences yeah. and we want you to get a taste of that as well you're going to get to hear a story from somebody from our fremont campus who went to that trip in france a nation where the major religion there is atheism and they got to do a ministry by singing gospel music of all things in a nation like this check out her story so the opportunity that i had was to visit paris yay sing with a gospel choir but also to reach a place that is so needing of God's grace and mercy. The majority of the population is either deist, diagnostic, uh, atheist, agnostic, a lot of spiritualism. Um, and the ministry that we partnered with is a Paris Gospel Church. Paris Gospel Church has also a choir, Paris Gospel Choir, that is separate from the church in that you do not have to be a believer in God to participate. And uh, amazingly enough, people in Paris love gospel music. And if we can worship together, the more that they sing those songs, but the more that they hear those words praising God, those seeds are being planted every time they say those words. Those seeds are being planted and God's just cultivating a baby Christian as they listen to those worship songs. And so being able to partner with Paris Gospel Choir in order to give my own testimony was just a way for God to use me and my story for His glory. We went on this weekend uh, retreat where we uh, rehearsed for the concert and you sit with different people that you don't know. Thank God they speak English. <laughs> Is my pair, my uh, French is just very, very bad. So, but I was able to give my testimony and that connection, you know. They are receiving your story. They are receiving your faith and they are accepting it. And you can feel God moving in, in that space. And afterwards, I found out that almost 20 people are close to giving their lives to God. And to me, that's a huge number. That's 20 more people that will build the house for the glory of Jesus, and I'm just so excited about that. Good evening. 
check the interest meeting. It's all in your digital program. That wraps up our service today. Hey, if you're part of Church Online, uh, our chat team is there to chat with you, to continue the conversation, but we're also doing an after-service hangout, so check the link in the chat right there. Right, and don't forget, if you are with us for the first time, stop by and see us at the Hub. It's a big red wall out there. And come back and join us next week for the big question, is Jesus really God? Come back, check it out.